This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining us today. With me is John Cameron, Richard Fields, and our special guest is candidate for Kern County Supervisor, Kelly Card. Uh, see, I told you I was going to butcher it. And, and It's Cardin, Garden with a C. And congratulations on you making the ballot. That's actually a big thing. It's, Thank you. A big deal getting on the ballot. I know what inspired you to actually run because it's it's a it takes a lot to get momentum to get people off the couch to get them onto the street to pound ground to get out in front of in front of crowds and to talk and to put yourself out in front of your community. That takes a lot of momentum breaker, right? Inertia. It takes an inertia breaker. What broke that inertia? Yeah, well, you know, ever since I was a kid, like you have to understand that the town that I'm living in and the county that I'm hoping to represent. I've lived in for 36 years. I've competed at every level of sports up into to the highest level that I can compete at, of course, at high school, um, other kind of competitions. I've always given back. You know, I mean, I, I remember the first time feeding the homeless was in junior high. You know, we did. My mom took me to feed the homeless here here locally. It's always been about giving back. But as far as getting off the couch, I think it was finally being fed up of watching everything go up. And really where they messed up was with the COVID response and keeping me home and giving me way too much time on my hands. So what, you know, what happened kind of back to back was our water bill went up at the exact same time that the trash bill went up and they're both, they were both tax increases, right? The land use tax fee. And then the water one was, was whatever they charged for the water bill. And that started it. And I said, man, like I'm not working right now. Why, why, why is everything going up today? Then you start thinking about other people. Like what, what are people that don't have the resources that I have? single parents, you know, senior citizens, these little things that they, you know, the, the government will tell you, well, it's only a hundred dollars a year or $13 a month or however they justify it, but they're not the ones that are paying that $13 a month that they already don't have. Right. It's somebody who makes considerably less money who didn't have a say that has to fork over this, the, these funds. And then I just started getting mad. And then I started thinking, I started looking inspiration nationally and you look at really the high profile races, AOC had just won. You know, and if AOC could do it, I can certainly do it, right? I, I'm just as as, not, as likable as her. I'm actually way more likable than her. And I, I'm, I'm normal, I'm not crazy, right? I'm not gonna pull my face off and show a lizard. It's just the ability that to connect with people, <laughs> you know? And then, then I started thinking, okay, well, maybe I, I wanna do something. So I just started talking to my neighbors and you all, you realize they all agree with you. Everyone shares the same thoughts. Everyone goes through the same struggles. So what I find, and then you, you, I met people in the Libertarian Party, right? Matthew Ryan Butts, who literally harassed me every day for months until I, I responded to a meeting, until I, I went to a Libertarian meeting online. I did a Zoom meeting uh, in 2020. And I said, you know what? All politics really is is ideas the ability to, to communicate those ideas and the ability to do so in a way that people can understand. And I can certainly do that, all three of those things. So everything happening all at once, all the bills going up, everything getting more expensive, seeing the, the hurt that was happening to my community um, with the COVID response, watching businesses go out of, out of business. My mother's owned a small business for 30 years now. I've worked in it since I was seven years old. And knowing that 60% of small businesses in Kern County closed la- over the last two years, half of those are never going to reopen. And how many people's dreams have been, were destroyed because the gov- the county government was too weak to stand up to the state government and too, too entwined and, and, and caring about their own political careers to, to say, hey, this isn't okay, you know? And so all of those things happen. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to be a voice for the people who are unwilling to say, to stand up, those who are afraid to stand up, those who 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 are afraid of the government responding against them and and, and bringing their aggression towards them at the at the local level. I'm not afraid of any of those things. So I said, you know what, guys, I'm going to run. I, I wrote a letter. I showed it to my wife, and I I handed it to her, and I said, would you be okay if I sent this to the to the newspaper? And it was literally I had written like a 500 page essay on why I was going to run for the Kern County Board of Supervisors. And she handed it back and she said, let's do it. And that was all the affirmation I needed. She, she said, let's go. She supports me in every step. She hasn't worked since my daughter was born. She's door dashing right now so that I can be here interviewing. So I can run for supervisor. We're all in on this. My family's all in on this. My kids are all in on this. Um, 
I said, you know what? I, I've been here for 30 years. My fam- my dad's been here since 1965. We're connected to this county as much as anybody is. I understand the issues of this county is better just as well as anybody else. And I can communicate those issues well. And I, I threw my hat, my name in the hat. And officially on, on, on March 11th of this year, I am officially on the ballot to run for the Kern County Board of Supervisors representing the second district. What are those issues? Uh, what are the issues that uh, uh, resonate most with the people who will be voting for you? So he, the people here in Kern County, they want, the thing they care about the most, of course, is the economy. How do they survive financially through this? So we're going to focus on, on helping small businesses reopen. We're going we're gonna to change the way all the resources are allocated so that we're not just throwing money at large corporations to, to move here, but we're helping mom and pop stores that were already open, that were already profitable making money, simply reopen now that the COVID response is for the most part over here in Kern County. That's one of the ways we're going to fix the economy. The second thing we care about in Kern County is oil and gas. We, every one of you went to the pumps sometime this week and said, holy cow, how is this gas so expensive? And, and here in Kern County, we pump more oil than the state of Oklahoma. So, and Governor Newsom is continuing to, to attack our, our oil industry. He's attacking our gas industry. He's putting tens of thousands of jobs on the line. And beyond that, hundreds of thousands of Kern County residents whose livelihoods are, are paid for by oil and gas. So what we're going to do there is we're going to help oil and gas monetize their waste to help them stay profitable. We're going to push back against the governor's over, over heavy handed response to shutting down oil and gas. And we're going to build a coalition amongst other counties to simply say, hey, we're not going to listen to this anymore. We're going to push back. We're going to pump oil and gas in a way that makes sense, in a way that's clean. We frack cleaner than anywhere else in the world here in Kern County. We should be embracing those kinds of technologies, not moving away from them. And then from there, of course, water issues. I'd like to see us in um, kind of work on some of the water infrastructure that allows raindrops to get back through the ground into the aquifers, as imposed into the state water project where we know is where all the waste really happens is once it gets into the state water project. So those are the three biggest things that we're going to be working on and term limits. So there's also, there's already a term limit bill. The guy that I'm running against is going to be on his fourth term. If he wins this year, we're running on that since he's been in office in 2010, Kern County has regressed in every statistical category. There is education, healthcare outcomes, poverty. We are now ranked in the bottom seven or eight in um, counties in the country, in the state in everything. It's embarrassing. So um, when I ran for office, I had this, you know, we figured we were going to run social justice issues and we were going to run on, you know, a handful of our issues. But as we progressed in our campaign, we found out that the community wanted us to talk about something else. They wanted mm-hmm. us to talk about function, water issues, they wanted, you know, water board issues. And they wanted us to talk about, you know, roles of government and and transparency, you know, kind of some basic, what I ended up calling was uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington issues, right? Just kind of, you know, kind of the, so what if, what have your uh, voters surprised you with in in this time? So I assume that the second amendment would be a much larger issue than it is here in the second district of Kern County. Kern County is known as one of the most uh, conservative counties in the entire country. And the second district where I live is even more conservative than that. And surprisingly enough, it hasn't come up. Like they don't feel like they see the threat coming, but they I don't think that they understand how this the county supervisor can kind of affect that. But what they want to talk about is, like I said, oil and gas. They want to talk about their businesses. They want to talk about property values. All these things are attached to the economy, of course. Um, I ha- they roads is are obviously huge. They and they they pay for them, right? They're already paying for the roads and their gases and the cigarettes and their DMV fees. And we, I was just in a, a community called Fraser Mountain, Fraser Park off of the five on the grapevine. And right when you get off the freeway, there's a pothole that is like nine inches deep and it's it's as wide as your car. There's no missing it. And they've been trying to get it fixed for years and they they fix it themselves. One of the, there's a business right there that what she did, she's been doing is pouring his own asphalt into it, but that's not fixing it, right? That's just helping them not destroy their own vehicles, but they can't get that fixed. So I was, and grow houses, you know, that was another thing that I didn't think would, come in as much as how much people want to talk about the grow houses. They're okay with sensible marijuana as long as the illegal grow houses go away. That's so it kind of took me a surprise. Yeah. And speaking of that, you know, in order for the illegal grow houses to get away, you have to have 
some system set up where they can grow that legally in warehouses, right? It's to get them out of the out of the houses, you have to grow them in warehouses, and so you, how it's getting that kind of set up is one of the tasks for you to solve that problem, right? Yeah. So here in Kern County, we're one of the two thirds of counties that do not have medical marijuana or any kind of marijuana um, legislature on books. There's no legal access to it other than um, delivery from another county. And it has to, of course, be delivered by person that can't be mailed. So, I mean, it history shows that that doesn't work. Right. And the, the end of prohibition had more bars open than the beginning of prohibition. So simply telling people to not do it isn't going to work, especially when it's, they're monetizing something. They're not just growing weed and smoking it. They're growing marijuana and they're selling it and putting money in their pockets. So, yeah, how do we stop that? Well, you let them put money in their pockets, but you do it via licenses, via ways to, and you open locations that can sell this. And obviously the stipulations be you have to purchase it from other legal businesses. And that's how you get rid of the, the illegal ones is by giving them avenues to be able to actually grow it and, and not have it be in your neighborhoods, be on farmland and warehouses. Yeah. Farm- I, got a, I got a question for you, Kelly. Um, yes, I'm a, I have a little bit different view about, about uh, pot since it's a weed. Um, the, the, what is the problem with the, with the grow houses? Uh, I don't know what's going on, but I like being the center of attention, but it should be focused on Kelly. Um, what, what, the, what are the problems caused by the illegal grow houses? The problems are caused by the, the, the weed being illegal. Yeah. So that it's then associated with people who are associated with other things. Wouldn't the wouldn't the better approach be to make it completely legal rather than? Or you're just saying this this is a bridge move between trying to deal with the fact that the government's not going to let it be completely legal uh, until it we can get there. I mean, what 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 kind of problems are the grow houses causing that are making you take that? that approach. So, I mean, if it was up to me, we, we, we would regulate weed the same way we regulate onions, right? Grow them. What's happening in these communities is they're building giant, they're literal houses. They're not just growing them in their closets. They're building huge greenhouses and then they're stealing water from their neighbors in many times. And there's no, nobody's enforcing that. So as much as I agree that it should certainly not be regulated any more than onions, um, we should still be protecting property values of other people that are paying the costs, right? So, or property rights of people that are also paying the cost. And so, yes, it is ultimately going to be a bridge issue until the federal government reacts or finally acts on medical marijuana, on on marijuana in general, takes it off of the schedule one. And then that's really when the issues are going to actually go away. Nothing's going to stop illegal grow houses. Even if we have a medical marijuana industry or growing medical, if we're cultivating marijuana in Kern County, they're still going to provide grow houses. There's never going to be getting rid of all of them. But I think the idea of offering people a legal way to grow is always going to be better than forcing them to grow something le- illegally. Yeah. Well, you you can actually make it cheaper to grow it legally than it is to grow it illegally. And so if you get it to that point where, hey, it's, it's actually cheaper and easier to operate legally, then there's no point to operate illegally. And I think that becomes uh, one of the strategies that we can like, take going forward. And at the risk of sending John on another rant here at the moment, high-speed rail in Kern County is kind of a big thing, right? It's There's a lot of jobs associated with high-speed rail, but yet it's a failure of a project. It's kind of been a boondoggle for a lot of us have pointed that out since the very beginning. You know, So what do we do about that as a Kern County supervisor? How do you bridge that, bridge that gap where you've got this economic engine, you know, the state's pumping all kinds of money in, into your community, you know, maybe it's a way to buy votes or to buy support for the project in a place that didn't have it. <laughs> you know, maybe that's the reason for it. But you've got that issue. But you also got the second time. This is a great big boondoggle that state taxpayer dollars, you know, taxpayer dollars from your Kern County residents are going to pay for this as well. And so how do you balance that as a supervisor? So the the current Board of Supervisors has, has stressed its, its opposition to the High Speed Rail Project. I agree with that. I think it is an absolutely terrible project. I think the longer, um, the longer lasting re- negative ramifications of the project will absolutely outweigh any temporary construction jobs that, that are currently being created. And that's kind of the direction I would take. I would continue to work by building a coalition of the counties where the, the rail's running through and finally trying to stop this because it doesn't, nothing about this is, is working, right? There, there's, there, I don't think they're, I mean, building much 
you can't see it. I mean, you see it a little bit in Fresno. I just see a little bit in Bakersfield. But they've been doing this since I was a kid. <laughs> I have kids yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> at what point do we abandon something? Or do, at what point do we continuously throw money at it because of the money wasted? Because that's all they're doing, right? They're realizing, oh, crap, we've wasted all this money. Let's just throw more money at it as if that was going to fix it. Unfortunately, this is a project that isn't going to work. It needs to be scrapped. And that's that's my thought on that. And quite frankly, that's the thought of the vast majority of Kern County citizens. In fact, the only people that I know that agree with it, they're 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 being they're on the job. Mm -hmm. I've never actually met anybody walking around who's had anything good to say about it unless they were benefiting from the money being put into it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Jeff Hewitt, uh, who uh, was elected uh, to the county board of supervisors in uh a Riverside County and before that mayor and city councilman in Calamisa was able to use public pensions, particularly firefighter pensions as a significant uh, issue. Uh, I'm sure that Kern County probably has public employee unions that uh, are uh, digging deep into the county budget through uh, pensions and, and union contracts, et cetera. Uh, have you been, have you, uh, are you modeling any part of your campaign after the Hewitt campaign? Are you, are you going after the uh, the uh, unions and they're uh, dipping way, way deep into public public uh, budgets? So, you know, when I first started, I assumed that was going to be a direction that I would have to go. But after just talking to the people of Kern County, they're more they're honestly more worried about the actual spending corruption, not the money that's being wasted into unions. Um, so they want to focus. I've asked I've asked the questions, you know, what do you think we should be doing with the public unions? They say, well, before you worry about people's jobs, you should be making sure that we're not giving away contracts. We're not wasting money. We're not getting involved in legislation. Or, I'm sorry, in litigation that costs millions of dollars a year. That, that's what they want to see done. So I think unions are a very, a very fragile relationship. Um, I've actually I've interviewed for several union endorsements. I haven't won any of them, um, but I've actually did well. As the SCIU, which is the local government, the county workers union voted over 50% to endorse me, but not the two thirds required to endorse. And I even talked to them about the benefits of privatization. So they just, I mean, the unions, of course, they want you to guarantee that you're gonna spend money on them forever. But the people just want to see as much transparency from the spending as they can. Yeah, I think the, the basic governance, right? Basic governance rules or basic governance issues. Or, you know, we talk about uh, kitchen table issues you know, the economic issues that we've gone over. But I think one of the things that we as libertarians, we forget, and this is room where we have to play, is the basic governance issues. You know, these people are being unethical. They make decisions in back, or at least it seems like they make decisions in back in the uh, smoke filled, in the proverbial smoke filled back rooms. Grow rooms. You know, That's where they're making grow rooms. Make, well, maybe if they made them in grow rooms, they'd make some better decisions. But yeah. <laughs> they at least provide, they think they, they do, they make, slower decisions they wouldn't react so fast if they were in a grow room getting you know making them <laughs> <laughs> more you know they spend some time thinking about other options right and and but how you know maybe that's a good thing how do we actually get engaged the the people and our politician engaged in in actual discussion so we can have some options other than options presented by activists because we know how this works activists are the people who get involved with politicians and so you end up with activist based solutions rather than community-based solutions. And I'm not blaming the activists. They're doing, you know, they're doing their, they're serving their role. It's the role of the politicians to bridge that gap. And so how do we do that? Well, so I think, I mean, as a libertarian, something that I have to be honest about is understanding that I'm going to be one man on a five man board. I'm not going to be able to shove through libertarian ideals at every, at every point, you know, but I can certainly move the conversation in our direction. Right. Um, single issue coalitions, I think, is the most important way to do that. For instance, I, I the Dolores Huerta Foundation is incredibly powerful here in the Central Valley. Dolores Huerta, she walked with, Ch she marched with Chavez, so she carries a lot of political weight. And I've come, me and her have been opposed on multiple issues, um, primarily the redistricting. They wanted to redistrict on a very um, racial ground, which I thought was offensive and, and stupid. It wouldn't work. And, but me and her all now we're agreeing with each other on term limits. So one of the ways is by being able to focus on single issue coalitions, which is really the beauty of being a libertarian, because I'm not, I'm not owed to either the Republicans or the Democrats. I can make decisions that I think make, make the most sense for my community while making sure that we're not raising taxes. You know, I've obviously taken a pledge as a member of the LP to never vote for a tax increase. Um, 
I think it's about, like you said, proper governance. That's what people want. People want to see access to their government. You know, I would like to make sure that I'm very visible in the community. So I'm, I'm talking and hearing the, the issues every day. Um, that's how you bridge the gap. By, by going directly to the people, hearing their issues and working it out with them, not just with the three or four activist groups that, that have screamed the loudest or built the biggest tents. It's the dissenting voices, not just the loud ones that are supposed to be represented. That's the actual um, purpose of government is to give um, voices to dissenting opinions. But the real dissenting ones are the, are the silent majority that stay at home that'll never actually speak up and get involved. Okay. You guys got anything before we have, get a kind of closing? Yeah, question? I have a question. Uh, has uh, the whole uh, uh, politics around COVID and particularly the government shutdowns around uh, the uh, so-called pandemic been an issue in Turn County? And if so, how are you addressing it? So I've, I've been incredibly outspoken against the COVID shutdowns. I can't believe I haven't brought that up. I've spoken at seven school boards. I've spoken at the Board of Supervisors multiple times. I'm demanding that we, we push back, right? So what the Board of Supervisors did is they issued a resolution that they all signed um, asking the governor to no longer pass COVID-based um, laws, right? But that, that's not enough. What I've done, the position that I've taken, and it's been incredibly popular because I think it's a position held by anybody who's reasonable, is that the proper response would be a resolution condemning them, refusing to follow them, and then working with our sheriff to make sure that not only does he, that we don't have COVID um, restrictions here locally, but that he refuses to enforce the ones that the state pushes down. So there are, there are or up, even up here in, in the heart of communist California, um, the Sacramento area, uh, the, the, um, some of the local sheriff's department refused to enforce <coughs> anything. So uh, was the was the Kern County Sheriff's Department enforcing uh, the state, or did did Kern County itself had have its own uh, uh, COVID policies that were hard on businesses and families? Well, sixty percent of small businesses closed in Kern County. Um, the sheriff, in theory, didn't enforce them. I mean, like like what uh, Mayor Villanueva did in LA. If you were called for wearing for refusal to wear a mask or show anything, he wouldn't take you. To, he wouldn't cite you for that. He would just cite you for trespassing. That's unfortunately the same thing that our sheriff did. I think that's kind of that's kind of a weak response. I think the proper response would have been to, "Hey, you better deal with that on your own." Hmm. <laughs> um, so there's that. Um, you're so up where you are in Yolo County. A good friend of mine, Zach Kincaid, he's been leading the charge in in his small town of Woodland, where they've been pushing back on the mandates. They were able to help get the school to. Um, I think what he said is up in Woodland, they had to wear masks outside, not just inside. Well, no, and, they had, but the, the, there's an elementary school literally a quarter of a mile from my house, and they're having the kids on the playground wearing masks. Yeah. That's it's, insane. Yeah, so Zach Kincaid, he's a member of the Libertarian Party. He does a lot of writing for the Beacon. Um, he helped lead that issue, and now in Yolo, and so in Yolo County, at least at that school district, the kids are at least not having the masks on outside. So I think it's celebrating every small step in victory, you know, but I'm not running a paper ballot, guys. I'm running the win. You know, I'm, I'm building a, a coalition. I've spoken at leftist, at left-leaning organizations as well as right-leaning organizations. I'm actually um, going to be interviewing for an endorsement from one of the largest business associations in Kern County on Thursday. And, and they've never endorsed my opponent. And he's this will be his fourth time. So that's huge. You know, if I can get that one, I have a chance, you know, and I, I, I think the people are ready. That's what's really been insane is, is it's just timing, right? That's yeah. a lot of times what beating these guys is, is just is getting lucky with the timing. Everybody is so mad at the government at every level that they want to see change. But you have to be able to put people out there that can relate with them. Yeah. Well, and speaking of that, with our communities divided, you know, over with over COVID, the economy, the divisions of the political divisions of the last of the last five six years, you know, our communities are all divided. We seem to be at each other's throats. Um, society seems to be breaking down, right? Crime is rampant. What can a board of supervisors do to help bridge the gap and start healing these communities? Start bringing our community back together. Start weaving these fractured webs of that have become fractured for whatever various reasons, right? You know. How do we, as a, as a county supervisor, how do you bridge that gap? I mean, how do you weave this fabric of society back together? 
So one of the things that I'm going to be doing is, is first off speaking to everybody, every, every civic group that I can find, every agricultural group that I can find. I think it's important that the, that your, your leaders are addressing these groups directly so they can hear from them directly, not just secondhand information. By doing that, what we should be doing as effective leaders as people who we expect that can, that can think critically is then say, okay, okay, I talked to this group and this is their issue. And then this group completely disagrees with them, but they have a similar issue. Where's the single coalition, right? The single issue coalition can be connected and each, each time you find one, it's a lifeline. And eventually you start connecting on enough coalitions where people realize that the only, the, that most of the issues that we have in our lives come from the conflicting forces of the, of the opposing political parties and viewpoints. But once you start finding single issue coalitions and you realize that, you know, I don't agree with John on this, but you know, he cares a lot about this thing that I care a lot about. It makes it more palpable to deal with what we disagree on and we can actually begin to communicate and find common ground. So it's, that's the other thing. I think it's important that for our leaders to, you know, show um, calm, you know, be able to, to not break out into outbursts, not allow their own political beliefs to, to constantly come into what they're supposed to do as governors or as, as governing bodies. For instance, we, uh, we're actually, um, Kern County is being investigated for a lawsuit because our the sitting chair of the Board of Supervisors, who is my opponent, um, got upset with an organization during COVID because they posted a um, defund the police meme on Facebook. And then he pulled a COVID contract of like $1.4 million that never was reissued or spent. And then I, I don't even know, I, I don't even know if it went back. I don't know if it's just sitting there or not, but it was never used. Regardless of my thought on COVID, I would certainly not steal something from somebody or, or stop something from happening based on that, right? Like he he's mad because they want to defund the police. So he's taking away COVID funds? <laughs> I assume that uh, people who uh, want to support your campaign can do so by uh, going to uh, the uh, website that up until just a couple of minutes ago was on the screen, uh, cardenforkern.com. Uh, what uh, can, what, what kind of uh, volunteer efforts are you providing for people who want to volunteer uh, in your ground game or otherwise uh, help with the campaign? So. Starting next month, we're going to start knocking on doors. Um, so if anyone wants to, if lives near enough to be here, they can definitely help with that. We're also staffing booths at fairs, at um, different kinds of events. Um, that way people are seeing us in the community. For instance, I'll be staffing a booth in California City. They have a two-day event happening at the end of the month, and we'll have a booth there. We'll be sponsoring Easter giveaways and different projects so, pe so people can continue to see us in the community. And then we'll also be looking for uh, text bankers, people that can make phone calls, I'm looking for somebody who would love to manage a social media page. I just, I'm not good at it. <laughs> I can hear you that. And we are about out of time. I want to thank you, Kelly, for being here. Thank you, John and, and Richard, for, for, uh, for joining us. And you all, thank you for watching. And please remember to love everybody. Thank you for watching The Libertarian Counterpoint. Listen each week in Sacramento on Comcast Channel 17 for Knuckleheads of Liberty on Monday at 5.30 p.m and the Libertarian Counterpoint Show on Thursday at 8 p.m. Also on YouTube, Facebook, and podcasts everywhere.